So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Thank you, San Antonio. I bring you greetings from the Little Rock Nine. I'd like to say to those of you present here, especially those of you who lived through those scenes with us, that I appreciate the prayers that you offered up on our behalf during that time, because without your prayer, without your considered support, I don't think we would have made it through. Dr. King came to Little Rock. We were there, a bunch of uh, raw teenagers, facing we knew not what, and he introduced us to the concept of nonviolence. He said to us, it makes sense for you to consider operating on a plane higher than the one occupied by those who oppose you, because they are acting as if they were savage animals. But you can be nonviolent human beings and demonstrate for them not only that you are willing to suffer whatever they have to dish out, but teach them a lesson in humanity as well. Yeah, please, I don't Dr. King was not that clear about whether we could do it or not. We were all so young. And he finally said to us, I'm nervous about you becoming nonviolent in this situation because you have no experience in the tactics of nonviolence. And in order for nonviolence to work, you have to truly love your enemy. And after some consideration, all nine of us said, yes, we can do this thing. We do love our enemy. We will make it work not knowing what we're getting into. And when you think about it, what happened at Little Rock was not a, an accident at all. It was orchestrated and set up by we the people, we the citizens of these United States of America. When you look at time, starting in 1619, we start a timeline there and moving forward until the year 1954. Between those years, 1619 and 1954, that represents a span of 335 years. 335 years. Now, the only reason we stopped the timeline in 1954 is because the Supreme Court of these United States ruled that discrimination was no longer constitutional. Prior to 1954, for that 335 year period, it was indeed constitutional to discriminate. Now, the question is, what has happened since 1954? Since that time, we have enjoyed about 54 years of continued existence. But consider this, if you do something for 335 years, I don't care what it is, you do not come to a screeching halt just because the Supreme Court says stop. And so you have to consider that this 54 year period has not been pristine at all. It has been polluted by what happened during that preceding period. We have leakage, carryover. We have residual elements, systemic threads woven into the fabric of today so that our task is to figure out how to cope with that. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of voices out there who say that things historical are over. They have no meaning anymore. The truth is, everything that ever happens historically is merely antecedent to everything else that ever will happen. And so that 335 year preceding period has informed who we are. It tells us about our policies and our programs, our intentions. Somebody asked me recently if I thought this past 50 year period since Little Rock 1957, we've made progress. And my initial answer was a loud screaming no, until my wife caught me and she said, you can't do that. You've got to tell at least the truth about those things that have happened. And so I reluctantly agreed and said, yes, there have been changes, but they're all veneer. A thin veneer of civility. We, today's citizens, have to realize that and be willing to take on the hard challenges that still exist. Now, I'm not one to decry progress if it's real, 
but I will not accept that which is pseudo or false. I was down in Little Rock recently in September. We did a commemoration of the events of 1957. 50 years had elapsed. And somebody again wanted to know about progress. And I said, you know what? I have to talk to you about Malcolm X in that regard. Somebody asked Malcolm once what he thought about the progress in America. And he said, you know, it's like this. If you plunge a 12-inch knife into my back, and then after great confrontation with you and pleading with you to please relent, you withdraw that blade two inches, and then you want to celebrate progress? I think we've got a 10-inch misunderstanding on our hands. Part of what I'd like to do today is to talk to especially the young people in the audience about the need for education, to understand what that 335 year period has meant, to understand what it means today, and to understand what you can do as a citizen of these United States of America. When I was a first grade student, my first grade teacher said to me, Terry Roberts, you've got to take executive responsibility for your own learning. You've got to take on CEO responsibility for your own educational enterprise. I bought into that. I loved education. I loved everything about it. And people in my neighborhood helped because they kept saying to me, boy, get your education. Boy, get your education. And I didn't even know what they were talking about at first. Where is it? Who's got it? Where is it hiding? And then they sent me to school and lights came on. And I understood what it was all about, finally.